Okay, so let's get started. So good morning, everyone, and good evening for those who are participating from US East Coast. And thank you very much for joining uh, our 26th special dialogue hosted by Global Health Innovation Policy Program at GRIPS. I am Hiromi Murakami, and I have a pri privilege of facilitating and organizing this dialogue series. And we initiated this dialogue series in 2020 in response to the challenge of COVID-19 and today's speaker, Steve, was one of our, our honorable first speaker back then. And so welcome back. And uh, within this the past three years, uh, we have shifted from uh, COVID-19 challenges to expand to expand our scope to you know, include various issues, including regional health issue, security issue, economic issue, you know, and the political disruptions, focusing on Japan's challenge. Today, we're very excited to welcome our special, special friend, Dr. Steve Morrison of CSIS, and uh, he'll be sharing his views on where should US-Japan Health Security Corporation go? It's a very fascinating topic. And looking back, you know, COVID lessons uh, learned and we, we see conflicts in Ukraine. And, you know, we know that the assumptions and the existing framework has changed, but it's very, really quite difficult to, you know, get people's attention for something that we don't have imminent danger. So this is a great opportunity for today that we have Steve so that we can learn how uh, the discussion in the US uh, are taking place and how the US-Japan cooperation can be and how things will be evolving in the future. So we like to extend our gratitude to United States Embassy Tokyo for funding this project, Japan Challenge Dialogue Series. We very much appreciate your support. We'll have Q&A sessions after Steve's remarks. So please uh, post your question on the Q&A box so that we can pick your, your uh, questions up when the Q&A session starts. And our commentator today is GHIPP Director, Dr. Kiyoshi Kurokawa, who has been engaging this realm of global health for such a long time. And Dr. Kurokawa is not only a passionate leader, but he has chaired numerous institutions, including Science Council of Japan and the Diet Investigation Committee for Fukushima nuclear power plant incident and more. So let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Steve Morrison, who is a senior vice president at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, and the director of its Global Health Policy Center. Through several high level commissions, he has been the key figure shaping decisions in Congress and administration on HIV AIDS, reproductive health and gender equality and health security, including pandemic preparedness. His CSIS, Smart Partisan Alliance for Global Health Security, is addressing critical post-COVID challenges. Since 2018, he has led Global Health Security Fora at the annual Munich Security Conference. He directed the new Barbarians, an award-winning documentary film about violence against the health sector. I also watched it. It's, it's a fascinating program. To great, you know, it's a great effective tool to address. Uh, awareness raising, and that include Ukraine, the human price of war. And he co-hosts the weekly podcast series, The Common Health. He served as the James R. Schlesinger Distinguished Professor at the University of Virginia Miller Center. He served in the Clinton administration on the Secretary of State Policy Planning Staff and on the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Africa. He thought for 12 years, at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, where I also study. With that, I'd like to pass a microphone to Steve for your uh, remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hiromi. And uh, it's wonderful to be back for this occasion. Uh, and special thanks also to Kiyoshi Kurokawa and to the US Embassy for its support and for everyone who's joining online today. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'm gonna do a couple of things. I wanna take a few minutes to talk about the launch in early 2024 of the new CDC East Asia Regional Office that will be based in Tokyo. I wanna unpack a little bit on why this is happening, what, the, what, what it signals, what's the significance of this. And then I'll say a few words about the broader uh, forces that are, that are driving closer and closer U.S.-Japan collaborations on health security. Many of those are geopolitical factors, 
uh, and the fact that the bilateral relationship is at a peak. I'll also talk um, a bit about the concrete areas where there's real promise for expanded US-Japan cooperation in health security in the next phase. Uh, I think it's very important that we be quite concrete about where investments should be made. And then I'll close with a few cautionary notes uh, about what it's gonna take to try and move this agenda forward, because it's not guaranteed, but the moment there's some momentum behind. Um, so uh, this new office uh, will be based in Tokyo and it'll be launched in early 2024. It's gonna be headed by Dr. Michelle McConnell, a highly accomplished uh, career public health diplomat and epidemiologist, a pediatrician with exceptional Asia credentials. So a decision has been taken by the Biden administration to really to really um, uh, appoint a, a quite serious and impressive personality to lead this. I, I want to put this in the broader context. CDC is moving towards a greater prioritization for these regional offices. Tokyo will be the fifth following Tbilisi, Georgia, Brasilia, Brazil, Muscat, Oman, Hanoi, Vietnam, and we'll be seeing a sixth in Panama City. It's, it's an expression of, a, of the need to bring forward uh, a, a, an approach within the regions that I've mentioned that is putting much more emphasis on collaboration, on partnerships, on coordination in the post-COVID period. And, um, and, and one which is bringing forward some of the special technical expertise that CDC has. But it's really a diplomatic, a, a geopolitical and diplomatic expression in my mind. Um, this office in East Asia based out of Tokyo will certainly strengthen the relationship with the Japanese government. And it will advance US national interests uh, and collaborations with Japan, particularly in strengthening preparedness against future dangerous outbreaks and improving the health status of the region's citizens. And it will in, in, in accomplish this through a combination of diplomacy, new partnerships, deepened alliances, resting on CDC's technical expertise. But first I wanna ask answer the question like, why Japan? This, this seems like an odd choice in the sense that Japan's the world's third largest economy, hardly needs CDC funding or presence or even technical assistance for programming in protecting its own citizens or in its regional programs. The decision was taken under the Trump administration. This is very important. This decision was taken initially under the Trump administration and then carried forward by the Biden administration. So it's bipartisan in definition. Um, when we look at this in the larger health security and strategic con context, this decision to go to Tokyo is quite smart, I think, and quite timely for two, two main reasons. One is the choice grew out of the recognition that the 70 year US-Japan treaty alliance is now at a historic peak. Amid rising geopolitical competition with China, that creates the opportunity, the need, and the political will shared by both governments to build innovative health collaborations that can bring wide benefits across the region. Japan's leadership on health, on global health during the G7 presidency this year, drew upon this close alignment with the United States and it was highly successful, the J Japanese leadership. Second, the choice grows out of the recognition reinforced by the COVID pandemic that health and security are inextricably linked and that a US health security diplomacy that drives new regional health partnerships with Japan and other neighbors will advance US national interests. It's a national interest argument behind this by strengthening alliances and cooperation. Then that reaches beyond Japan, obviously, to other longstanding allies, South Korea, Australia, the Philippines, increasingly India, that advance the health and well-being of Asia's citizens. What exactly will be the special value of a Tokyo regional office, given that CDC already has presence in country in many of the countries that will be served? 
First of all, it's a regional, it will have a regional reach that will attempt to close big gaps. By that, I mean during the worst of the pandemic, many low and middle income countries in Asia and elsewhere in the world face gross inequities and delays in timely and affordable access to vaccines, therapies, PPE, protective gear, oxygen, as the most wealthy and powerful nations pursued a narrowly nationalistic approach to satisfying their sovereign needs. Countries of the global South suffered disproportionately as a consequence, and they're looking for verifiable proof that the most powerful and wealthy countries are changing their ways to invest at a higher level in regional capabilities. A CDC regional office can begin to speak systematically to that tough question with a local regional presence. It's a diplomatic tool with visibility and reach that can bring a strategic coherence to CDC's work across these different um, country programs. It can, it can help advance security partnerships such as the Quad, the security grouping of Japan, India, and Australia, and the United States that's already driven forward an initiative on regional vaccine production and conducted health security exercises. ASEAN is an increasingly influential organization and is developing a regional hub for public health emergencies. Japan is playing a strong role in standing up this entity and CDC and Japan can work together to ensure its success. A regional presence on the ground versus operating from simply country offices or regional headquarters in Japan, I mean, in, in Atlanta, can greatly enhance local knowledge and enrich relationships. Last, this office will offer specialized expertise that meet the evolving needs emerging from the region in workforce development, in data, systems, laboratories, and communications. In the latter, it's really a call for better strategies for combating misinformation, disinformation. This is a new model of US health diplomacy. It's a fairly lean office focused on relationships and collaborations with the ability to tap the exceptional depth of expertise at CDC headquarters. It's gonna take certain things to succeed. It's gonna take strong leadership, already has an impressive leader in place, but it needs to be empowered by Washington to play an active and innovative diplomatic role, free of micromanagement. It needs to build strong and enduring ties and collaborations with its Japanese host. And it will need the nimbleness to pivot as it discovers new region-wide priorities. And it needs ample and flexible core operating resources that provide stability and predictability that reach beyond the fixed timeline of individual programmatic funding. Global health security is national security. This CDC office should not be seen as a development activity. It should be seen as a health security collaboration with global partners, influential global partners, starting with Japan. This is a moment of opportunity. U.S.-Japan ties have never been stronger and the U.S. is actively building its relations across the region. This geopolitical reality creates a bounce. It creates an opening to do more in health security and other key health security areas. The CDC regional office, if adequately supported, will advance U.S. national interests, benefit the health of the region citizens and bring credit and prominence to CDC as America's premier national public health institution. I wanna pause and at this moment, stand back a little bit to talk about the broader relationship, US-Japan relationship. We hosted a US-Japan exchange in March of this year with a special focus on the geopolitical factors that are pressing towards greater cooperation by these two governments in global health security. I've mentioned already it's the US-Japan relationship is at a peak moment. The strategic relationship has grown in the context of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the increased geopolitical competition with China. The Israeli-Gaza crisis is now an important factor. It also coincides with a convergence of opinion and thinking between the US and Japan on global health issues, particularly on universal health coverage 
pandemic preparedness and response, health diplomacy, and the generation of new, new technologies. This is an opportune moment for expanding health security cooperation. And there are many opportunities. The CDC regional office is the most notable and live and compelling. Um, but we have other, other aspects of this that we need to keep in mind. Um, on the UHC dimension, under Octul Gawande's leadership of USAID, he is the assistant secretary, assistant administrator uh, for, for the Bureau of Health at USAID. He has become an active proponent of UHC health development as an important pillar of the Western Bloc's outreach to the global South. This alignment of UHC enables a stronger partnership between the US and Japan development agencies. Um, it, it, it offers new opportunities for investment, parallel investments between the US and JICA and others. Um, this is a, a one very important way of delivering sustainable capabilities uh, to partners in the global South that's a credible and effective counter to Chinese influence. I wanna mention one other thing, which is at the G7, um, in both the communique, the leaders communique and the health uh, communique, health ministers communique, both US and Japan signal an openness and early support to the Global Health Emergency Corps led by the World Health Organization. Um, this is intended to build interoperable surge capabilities that would draw on talent from around the world to mobilize support into areas that are uh, dangerously threatened by outbreaks, by dangerous new pathogens. It also calls for creating a network of high level leadership in health security across key countries and getting US and Japan into the mix as early adopters, early partners to this, to this uh, uh, Global Health Emergency Corps will be very important in moving it forward, legitimizing it and the like. And I was very encouraged to see in the G7 communiques uh, that alignment beginning to emerge. Let me just say a few words about what next. What can and should the US and Japan do next to take advantage of this ripeness in their bilateral relationship? First, there should be much more active focus on how to take advantage of the alignment around universal health coverage and how that ties to the sustainable development goals. How to identify concrete opportunities for the US and Japan to collaborate on UHC. That's the first point. Second point is the quad, within the quad, there is a subgroup on policy innovation co-chaired by the US and Japan. How can a regional security alliance like the Quad best strengthen global health architecture? This is a question that is ripe for this kind of security arrangement, US, Japan, India, Australia. There's an opportunity to, to build on the Global Health Emergency Corps commitment to identify and discuss and overcome whatever outstanding barriers and concerns there are, and to move forward to press for uh, accelerated uh, implementation of pilot work in this area to get this off the ground, get it moving. It's, it's, it's showing promise, it's taking shape, it's an interesting uh, initiative that pulls in the WHO into an important leadership position. AMR, antimicrobial resistance, is a priority of both governments. In the Japan case, it's a relatively new priority, newer priority, and we saw it get considerable attention under the Japanese presidency in the G7 communique, leaders communique and the health ministers communique. This is a big year for antimicrobial resistance. There will be a high level meeting in the fall at the UN General Assembly. Uh, this is another way in which US and Japan could lock arms and move forward in a very concrete way on how to advance those key areas around AMR. I wanna say a few words about what happened in San Francisco 
in November earlier this month uh, at the APEC summit and at the uh, summit uh, with uh, Presidents Xi and Biden, there was an agreement uh, at the APEC summit to renew the actions of what's called the APEC Regulatory Harmonization Steering Committee. Now that committee is co-chaired by the US and Japan. It's been very successful. It has had very impactful annual meetings and numerous workshops. It has moved forward training on standards and quality of harmonizing regulatory policies. It's something that's open to all. It doesn't, it, it, it brings benefits to the low income as well as high income countries within the region. It had stopped its work for the past two years owing to Chinese objections. Those have been overcome. It's now going to renew its work. That's promising. That was a quiet breakthrough at the APEC summit. We should take advantage of it. Well, I haven't said much about the, the, the negotiations on the pandemic convention and IHR reform. On the pandemic convention, the four key areas are One Health, access and benefit sharing, financing, and data and surveillance. Now, negotiations have just gone through, through their latest round. We've got a first text, real text. There is a target for achieving a resolution of this process by May of next year. That's not likely to happen. But if there can be substantial progress made by the spring, uh, it could be extended. And the US and Japan, it seems to me, share a very common perspective, pragmatism, centrism, embrace of equity as a major new norm with respect to access and sharing on key technologies and other key commodities. This is a new era post COVID in which norms have changed significantly. And the US and Japan share many of the same outlooks on these critical issues. We need to get results. We need to see meaningful results in a reasonable timeline. It may require an extension, but this is an area for cooperation. U.S. capacities, I wanna just emphasize that U.S. capabilities are, in, are, are improving in health security. The CDC regional office and the other regional offices, in my mind, are a very major development in that regard. But I want to mention a few other things. Um, the State Department at the in the summer of this year launched a new Bureau of Global Health Security and Diplomacy. Launching a new bureau at the Department of State is not easy. It's very cumbersome process. Uh, it, it's a politically fraught and complicated process inside the US government as well as with Congress. This is building on the strength of the achievements of the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, PEPFAR, and it is elevating the leadership of PEPFAR. So uh, Dr. John and Ken Gazong is becoming the head of this bureau. It is combining the infectious disease programs of around HIV with global health security under one roof. And it's making it, uh, giving it the status of a bureau, which means that there will be more legitimacy, credibility, and muscle to the US diplomatic process. That's very important. At the White House, in this same period, we had launched this summer, the Office of Pandemic Preparedness and Response. This was mandated by Congress in the omnibus spending bill for this year. And the White House has created that new office and chosen Gen Major General Paul Friedrichs, a very highly esteemed and well-regarded individual to head that office. And it is meant to be much more of a command and control and coordination entity within the US government um, across it, bringing much greater coherence and efforts, both domestic and global. So we have those two institutions now uh, uh, formed up with very strong leadership at the helm, Dr. Nkengazong, Major General Friedrichs. There's a few other very important uh, uh, things to mention in terms of our capacity. There's been a change of leadership. Uh, Dr. Tony Fauci, Dr. Francis Collins have both retired. 
Dr. Fauci is head of the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases for since 1984, a legendary figure. Francis Collins ran the National Institutes of Health for 12 years and retired at the end of 2021. Well, we now have new leadership. At CDC, Mandy Cohen, who's come in to head up CDC. There's a new deputy director of CDC for global affairs, newly created position, Howard Zucker. At NIH, just a few weeks, just a short while ago, Monica Bertignoli, who headed our National Center for uh, Cancer, National Institute for Cancer, NCI, has now become the successor to Francis Collins as the head of the National Institutes of Health. Great excitement about that. We now have a new, new, new institution called ARPA-H, modeled after the defense uh, experimental institution DARPA. A, DARPA. ARPA-H is meant to take high risks on the development of solutions, technology, and, and other practices. Rene Regrizin is now heading that. At the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, we have Arati Prabhaka leading that institution. And on the negotiating team for the pandemic convention, the negotiations over the pandemic con convention, we have Special Envoy Pamela Hamamoto and her team. You might notice that with a few exceptions, most of these leaders are women. Uh, this is new and different. Uh, and a signal of something very important that's happening in our own leadership ranks in global health security, and particularly at the high level and, and, and diplomatic. Let me close with just a few very brief uh, cautionary remarks. Um, let's get back to the US-Japan bilateral partnership and collaborations. These ideas that we're talking about this evening, to move them forward, it's gonna be very important to build them systematically into the planning by the two governments, into their relationship, and to build into that planning annual processes of, of, of review and discussion. These action areas that I've enumerated, it's gonna be important to achieve concrete deliverable results uh, to prove the value of the collaborations. They've got to generate momentum. They've got to continue moving forward. The annual review will help in that. And I think that's, that's really important. I think that pushing this bilateral relationship has to register in, in health security, has to register in the minds of those at both the Department of State, NSC, and elsewhere who are looking at this relationship as a strategic relationship, but may probably not thinking in terms of health too much or enough, that can be changed. Budgets are tight. As I mentioned earlier, the CDC regional office in Tokyo is gonna need adequate and sufficient and, and reliable and predictable funding. There is in our system and in your system, the, the pull of the cycle of crisis followed by neglect the pull to, to turn away from pandemic preparedness and response, put resources into other areas. That should be no surprise. In our system, we also have quite a debate going on as Republicans in control of the House have put forward very dramatic cuts in budgets, including a very stark cut in the CDC budget. Those are debates that, that, that will play through, but it's very important to preserve the budgetary base, the foundation in both systems in order to move this forward. We haven't talked much, I haven't spoken much about the centrality of the private sector to all of this, but I think that there much more can be done to incorporate US and Japan private industry into these burgeoning partnerships that I've outlined, especially at this moment when it is an official priority in Japan to accelerate the advance of the Japanese biotech sector. And that biotech sector has made clear its desire to partner more closely with American counterparts. Um, this, is pro this is a promising moment. This is 
a place where we really need to be very strategic in thinking about the role of the private sector and make sure that it is at the table and part of this. It will build the constituency. It will build the legitimacy and the support in both countries for advancing that partnership. Last point is both of our countries are democracies. Both of our countries can change course through, through electoral processes. Uh, both of our countries could see a change of government that brings a government into power much more skeptical or, or even antagonistic towards some of what I'm arguing here. The strategy of building the, the cooperation has to take in mind creating something that is permanent and endurable and, and has attached to it strong constituencies that are bipartisan or across the political aisle that will defend these and see the real value of these in advancing national security, global security, and bring concrete results that, that really reward this type of strategy. I'll close there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Steve. That was very broad and the very stimulative uh, points that you raised. So let me um, ask first question. Um, it's very um, encouraged to see that new team is, is uh, inaugurating in the US and also the new institutions that not only uh, in the US, but the CDC Japan uh, is, is getting on a set. So my question is, we, we have these reviews and looking back and what's learned from this COVID-19 and what is it that really uh, hit like those experts, like people like you to experience COVID-19 and you sort of regret and that came as like a driving force to create those new institutions and the new uh, you know, movement to go toward, uh, to tackle this uh, health security issue? Well, I think that um, we didn't do a very good job in the United States at creating a formal review of what happened in the US performance at home and abroad. There was an effort led by uh, Philip Zelico uh, at the University of Virginia who uh, led the 9-11 Commission uh, over 20 years ago. Philip put together a group, a very diverse group. I was part of that effort. They worked for over two years, laying the groundwork, doing the, during the, early, re doing the early research and writing around what had happened with the principal focus on the domestic side, but some on the international. But politics got in the way of trying to get such an effort into a national commission, like the national commission that Kurokawa-san led on the Daiichi plant disaster in 2011. We couldn't make it. Uh, there was a hesitation within the White House to, to opening such a commission in current circumstances. There was a lot of division within Congress around this. And so that didn't happen, but people turned their attention to uh, very important options that could be achieved. And those turned into institutional strengthening initiatives. CDC went through a crisis of trust and confidence. It went through a performance crisis. It suffered some big stumbles there was a recognition that CDC was in trouble uh, and the turn towards new leadership and the effort at revitalizing the institution was driven out of that awareness of the need to restore capability and legitimacy and trust and confidence. There's gonna be a big hearing this week over in the House and the Energy and Commerce Committee focused on exactly this question of what has the new leadership created is that enough uh, and, the, and the like? And so I think that there was a recognition that we needed a new, a new team of leaders to change the, to give new energy, a, a, a newer generation, uh, a, a leadership that was not part of the response in the period when things became so politicized and so hardened so the people that are in place, Doctor, I mean uh, General Friedrichs, 
um, Mandy Cohen, some of these folks, none of all of these folks had been have enormous reputations as very strong leaders uh, in their fields, but they don't carry the baggage or burden of what happened during the acute phase of the pandemic. And that has allowed the possibility for people to think again, what do we really need to protect Americans versus retribution and acrimony and politicization? Change of leadership and a putting a focus upon strengthening institutions has been a strategy. I don't think it emerged as a as a as a coherent strategy. It simply evolved in time. Our governments tend to sort of act in that way. In the creation of the White House office, this was something that emerged in the Senate with Senators Murray and Richard Burr as a priority, a Republican and Democratic leadership of the of our Senate Health, Health Committee, our Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, that they needed a command and control center within the White House, and they pushed this forward. So bipartisanship as a reform agenda has continued and won applause and been able to move forward. And I think that that is proving that while we are very deeply divided, very polarized, we have a pervasive environment of misinformation, disinformation. A lot of people are saying they want to turn away from COVID. Well, a lot of other people want to see the restoration of stronger and better functioning institutions. And that argument is starting to work, frankly. Great. Um, thank you very much. So now we have uh, Dr. Kurokawa on board. Um, I think we also in Japan had all the review sessions and you know what did what we did for the COVID-19 years. Dr. Kuroka, would you like to share with us like what we really learned and what sort of action that we really came up with like in the United States or do do we have any new actions um, from Japan to to deal with that what we have missed, what we have regretted in the past? What we deal with it. Uh, Kuroka said you need yeah. to turn on the microphone. Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your great uh, sort of uh, uh, session and your insight into US Japan and the sort of rising China issue and uh, your meeting in San Francisco. Uh, I guess three, three years of Corona issue pandemic that sort of paralyzed the way of thinking of many people. The reason being because we need to really have a session in face-to-face -face session, but we are using mostly Zoom. And I, I kind of think feeling the uh, necessity of face-to-face -face meeting and these kind of things as a human being. Yes, just all the digitization may not be working that well. And also, I'm a bit worried about the sort of Chinese Xi Jinping, but I think uh, there's some internal uh, issue right now, I think, emerging in that area. And the meeting with the uh, top of two in San Francisco helps something. And another one, there's many, many unstable issues right now. Uh, we are sort of uh, 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 sharing together. And I think we invited with uh, Hiromi, just we invited a new ambassador from US to to Japan, which is a very insightful, uh, very competent person. And he really made a very nice presentation and discussion session with, at the GRIPS. And I think I think we are lucky to have such an ambassador at this time, but I think uh, communication with also prime minister, <laughs> right now is a bit of uh, low, lowish. And uh, these are the sort of very much concern around us from my view. How you see that? I mean, that is a very difficult issue right now and very complicated and too much pressure to US right now. What's happened in Israel, and what's happened in China issue, all the things. And somehow everybody just was looking at the US, but I think that is a bit wrong. And these are sort of very unstable, unpredictable world affairs that I'm a bit concerned about it. 
but at least we have a uh, right uh, ambassador right now uh, from US to Tokyo. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. I, can, well, I can see from your background that you have not walked away from your love of San Francisco. <laughs> right. But I think this is very unstable right now in the world and everybody just look sort of asking the US what kind of thing they they would do, they could do. I mean that is a bit unfair in my view. Well, I, I, that's a very important point that you've made. Yeah. Uh Kiyoshi. Um the there is we are very much we, the, Japan, the US, other powers are very much stressed by this combination of having intensified right. competition with China. The Ukraine war, yeah. which is in a very right. uncertain phase. Right. Very uncertain phase. And now this crisis in, in Israel and Gaza, which is on a could go any number of directions. Right. Of course, these all test the political capacity, the di diplomatic capacity, the financial capacity. Right. And put enormous stress and raise the question, is there space still for the agenda we're talking about? And right. I think that you have to be both very realistic, but also optimistic. Mm -hmm. The wheels of government continue to turn. Mm -hmm. In other words, you get a reform process going for CDC. You get a building of new institutional capacities at the Department of State and at the White House. We have security doctrines that have been passed in the course of the pandemic. Now, a variety of different national security doctrines that have elevated health security. By, yeah. do by doing that, that creates accountability. Mm -hmm. Those Security agencies have to come back and report to within their within their department and to the White House on what they're doing to invest in these priorities around global health security. We have a new global health security strategy coming right. out right. into the year, early next year. So right. there's, when I say wheels of government are turning. It's partly this process doesn't change. Mm -hmm. the fact that security doctrines changed in the course of the pandemic matters very significantly in yeah. the way that dollars are invested and people are held to account and the like. But I also think we have to be realistic. Budgets are going to be extremely tight in this next period, right? You're right. And political and, you know, capacity, diplomatic capacity right. is, is going to be stretched. Stretched right. very, very wide. But we have to get through this. Mm, right. I do, want to, I do want to mention one thing, which is just this is a little bit of an advertisement, but we started a broadcast on November 13th, a one hour broadcast on what's happening inside Gaza in terms of health and humanitarian needs. All right. And we're doing, we're doing a second broadcast this Friday at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. We'll have the head of UNRWA in Gaza. We'll have mm -hmm. the head of the emergency uh, uh, operations out of Cairo and a couple of my colleagues. I'll send you the notice for this. I know this will be in the middle of the night, your time, but people can watch it later. It will be posted on the yeah. website. Those who are watching the Gaza crisis, the Gaza-Israeli crisis, know mm -hmm. that this is a staggering health and humanitarian crisis. Um and we're not out of it. And and it, it is going to consume vast amounts of resources and energy. So mm -hmm. just as a point to what you were saying, yeah. how do we move ahead in this period? We have to be able to, to walk and chew gum at the same time. Right. Right. At least I participate in part of this Health Minister G8 Summit in Nagasaki. Right. It's very positive that time. And I think I, I was uh, allowed to make comment on this uh, in their session. Yeah. What? Tell me what your reflections are on the yeah. Japanese yeah. leadership for the G7. Because, you know, when I read that communique, yeah. my sense was Ukraine brought the G7 back to a very high prominence, and that right. opened the door 
to put a big focus on economic China's economic coercion, but also mm -hmm. a big focus on health. There were very long passages on AMR, very long passes on pandemic preparedness and response. Yeah. We would not have seen that level of commitment from the G7 if it hadn't been sort of brought back to life. And yeah. the Japanese government was expert, it seems to me, in moving it forward. Right. Because at that time, you remember, I think uh, we have uh, all these uh, vaccines for Corona. That was a sort of winning issue over the last three years or so. Yes. Yeah. So the so the spirit was reasonably high on the health minister's G A summit thing. Yes. Time, but I think the dementia is an issue because I have been the vice chair of World Dementia Council, which is a product of uh, uh, G A summit hosted by by David Cameron ten years ago. I think now I think that's uh, made a reasonably good progress, but I think as we live longer, dementia is unavoidable at, at this moment. You mean amnesia? You mean forgetting? Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. I'm forgetting that. What are the sort of early signs or diagnosis of dementia issue? Everybody yeah. took care of dementia, this or that, but early signs of dementia is a key, in my view. Okay. Right. So we're welcoming um, any questions you may have. You can post to the Q and A box, um, sure. please. So this is, uh, we have time for question and answer. So please uh, post if you have any questions. So um, I think you mentioned, um, you know, you both mentioned China and uh, unlike security uh, arena, health is the place I think can be collaborative <laughs> with China for like environmental issue as well. Uh, I think what the San Francisco um, uh, summit they had uh, they, they had talked about the environment issue. So I think health is also the one of those issues where China and the U.S. and the rest of that can can collaborate. So how do you see? I mean, of course we have quad you know those security uh, uh, arrangement, but uh, how do you see the health sector could be maybe you know the way to get some of the you know, the rapprochement between China and the U.S. and then can be improved for the, the to the worldwide betterness of the um, health uh, situation. What do you, how do you see those things? Um, well, we've, uh, at CSIS, we've been very active for the past two and a half years or more in arguing to both the U.S. government and to the Chinese government that there is a dangerous gap between those two governments. That at the senior levels, there is no active dialogue around preparing for the next dangerous outbreak. There's, at the technical level, there's an interest in keeping cooperation going and there's still some exchange. When you go outside of government to universities and corporations and, and, and philanthropies, there's a very active track to series of contacts and the like. But when you look at the high levels of the government, there has been a deterioration, significant deterioration of the US-China relationship. And there's been very, very little, if anything, done in, in, in getting the two countries at a senior level talking to one another. Now, at the same time, the military communications after Con uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, summer before last, military communications were broken. And of course, that, that set off lots of anxiety. But we were arguing you need to get back to the table on this, on the, on the security stuff. Well, to be honest, I mean, we proposed track 1.5. The Chinese were willing to come to the table. The administration was more hesitant. Then things deteriorated with the, with the uh, shoot down of the, um, weather balloon that, that floated across North America. Uh, there's been, there was, you know, a series of, of cabinet level visits to Beijing or meetings by Jake Sullivan with Wang Yi and others in Malta and in Vienna and the like that led up to President Xi coming to San Francisco and meeting with, um, with President Biden. But health 
did not, I mean, there was a one thing that I mentioned about the steering committee, the regulatory harmonization steering committee of APEC that the US and Japan co-chair. China quietly agreed to allow that to support getting that committee going again. And that's an important step. But in the communique, there was only fentanyl precursors, which is a separate issue really, military communications, and, and a few other things. But health was absent, and that was a surprise to us because just a year before, when Presidents Xi and, Pu and, and, and Biden met in, uh, in Bali at the G20, they issued a joint statement that said, cooperation should accelerate in health and climate. Now, they didn't say the same thing this time around. And I, I think that's a marker of how politicized the issues around Wuhan, around data sharing, data surveillance, uh, and the investigations in Congress against the Chinese government, how all of that, they just don't want to go there. And, and I think the Biden administration is, has a similar hesitation. So I think we're going to, the issue is not going to go away, but we're going to have to be more patient. I was hopeful that we'd see something come through. The areas where they should be talking are financing, our workforce development, our R&D for new technologies and equitable access for new technologies, uh, and data and surveillance. Those are the four big areas that need, that need a sit down at a senior level to talk about the comparative approaches. I think if you do introduce opioid and you do introduce aging and dementia and other things, that may widen the field and allow for more uh, to get something going again. But it's been a tough road. It's been a tough road. And I think that there's a danger, a big danger, in having the two superpowers not talking to one another at senior level about preparing how they're going to communicate with each other as new dangerous pathogens emerge, because they will emerge. And uh, we need, we can't afford what happened in COVID, the breakdown of the relationship, the breakdown of communication and the like. And I agree more. So there's one a question from the audience. Let me read it. So thank you very much for wonderful seminar presentation. I think there must be a lot of lessons in terms of human security and health security while experiencing the COVID-19 phase. Especially, I think the US must have felt more and more crisis about the world policy because it was one of the countries with the highest number of COVID-19 victims. In this process, I think balancing between socioeconomic freedom and quarantine by state control has become very critical and important issue. What do doctors think in the role of national policy to achieve the optimal balance point? That's a great question. We are going through a debate right now about how do you balance out individual freedom and democratic process and values with the concern with protecting the community and the need for interventions that require people to make sacrifices for the broader good. And we didn't do very well in our country on that. We didn't have a consensus in our society. We had the opposite. I think Japan's experience was quite fundamentally different. Uh, there was a national consensus. There was compliance. People were not offended at wearing masks. They were already wearing masks. And so we've had some hard lessons and uh, there's a lot of soul searching going on right now. But I think also it's important to, for us to acknowledge, yes, our response was very, very problematic. We lost 1.1 million people. We had millions who wound up in extreme health circumstances in ICUs and, 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 and other uh, hospital settings, uh, traumatic experiences for a big segment of our population. And that has, that has created a lot of grief and a lot of disappointment and frustration. And then we emerged from this very angry at each other and very divided and we've got to 
figure out how to move forward on this. One way for moving forward is to look at the, the, what happened below the national level, because when you look at the response in the United States, the 10 best performing states in the United States were on par with Japan or Sweden or others. And they were half governed by Republicans and half governed by Democrats. And they weren't all clustered in one coast. They were distributed around the country. Why is that? It came down to a number of factors and we're just beginning to understand. Some of it was leadership. Governors and mayors and others were closer to the ground. They were less prone oftentimes to, to polarizing and exploiting these divisions and much more inclined to be creative at building partnerships with community leaders and industry and universities that had special capabilities and the like in order to find some ad hoc innovative solutions for this crisis. And we're looking at, that's one of the projects we are busy looking at. Um, and so there is a positive side to the fact that we had such a difficult experience and it was so fraught and, 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 and the like is to understand where did that not happen in our society? And it did not happen in many places. Great, thank you. So we're almost time. So uh, Dr. Kurokawa, would you like to uh, have some comment at the end? In fact, in fact, do you hear me? Yes. In fact, I think uh, Corona, COVID is sort of down now after three three years, but I think another crisis at the moment, I think as we see how we could, how we could learn from the history of we, <laughs> human being repeating the same thing again and again. We never become wiser. That's my sort of a more pessimistic comment in a way. But I think we are very important. It is very important, even Corona, but I think we have to have a more face-to-face -face discussions. <laughs> it is a very important element as a homo sapiens in my view. I agree entirely, uh, right. Dr. Kurosawa. Uh, Kurokawa, I, I think that We've got to get back into this habit of having very strong face-to-face -face dialogues. Yeah, right. You we have pay, We paid a huge price by that interruption. Yeah. And we have to make a deliberate decision to get back into that. It will correct for misperceptions. Right. Restore trust and understanding. Yes. And stability. Yes. And it will allow us to trade our knowledge and best practices yeah. in a much more real way. Yeah, thank you. I think that was great, I think, to see you and uh, discuss these issues with you. And we miss you. to go to DC. <laughs> <laughs> well, please come. We look forward to seeing you both All right. here. And please also you. come visit to, to Japan so that we can have face-to-face -face meeting. Okay, and well, we're hopeful about doing something with at the launch of the CDC regional office. And yes, I'll be that would be very, very good. Yeah, we're very looking forward to have the active CDC Japan regional office to be part of this uh, uh, global security, health security collaboration. Thank you very much. And please join me to applaud uh, Dr. Steve Morrison. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, we are closing. Oh, thank you very much for the oh, lot of applause from audience. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, with this, uh, we're closing this uh, a special dialogue uh, with uh, Dr. Stu Morrison. And thank you very much. And I'll see you next time. Thank you very right. much, Steve. See you thank next you. time. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. All right.